to NURFM.com, a broadcast service of the University of Newcastle. We like to cast an eye across state and federal politics. We do that with the University of Newcastle's Associate Professor in Politics, Dr Jim Jones. Joining us now, it's been another big seven days. Part of that has been, oh, has the federal government fallen over? We've got the forthcoming budget coming our way, Jim, and an announcement of a black hole. What's your thoughts on this? Well, good morning, Dave. Well, my, my initial thought is that the metaphor of a black hole is a, is a nice piece of politics, but it doesn't actually convey or give us any idea about what's really going on. There's a, a lot of, um, shall we say, hot air um, being um, uh, pumped out about this. But what we are seeing at the moment, and both sides of politics, of course, are spinning this around to um, suit their own uh, political agendas, but basically what we're seeing is that the uh, revenue side of the budget has not met the forecasts, and that's partly because of a, a slowdown in the, in, um, the commodity sector um, the in, the anticipated income has fallen. The tax base has shrunk a little as against what was predicted, and that means that um, the government's now got to try and figure out how it's going to match or meet its projected spending. Now the opposition at present is sort of saying how this is a spending blowout. They'd be loving this, wouldn't they? Oh, my, most certainly. <laughs> I mean, um, they're making as much hay as they possibly can because they're not as closely under the microscope over this. Um, although, if we put it in the, in the context of a bigger picture, uh, we might suggest that um, they don't have too much to crow about as yet. But at the moment, they're able to sort of make some mileage, um, politically speaking. It's not really a spending blowout. Um, what we see is, a, as I said, a, a shortfall in, in anticipated revenues to match up against the anticipated or um, planned spending. Now, the government has... Um, various opportunities to rejig that relationship. Um, it could up some taxes, it could um, cut some spending, but basically it's um, got some, some room for manoeuvre. The other thing, though, that we need to quickly sort of note is where it doesn't have any room for manoeuvre is that we are in a, shall we say, a political... Uh, ideological position where balanced budgets is has become the mantra of Australian politics for the past 15 to 20 years. And so if they don't balance the budget or have a surplus, that's another dimension of the mantra, then they're seen to be poor economic managers. That is good politics for the opposition, not so for the government. However, if we step back and look at the reality a little bit, um, the economy is in pretty good shape. So mm. the government hasn't got, um, shall we, shouldn't have an issue over poor economic management. It only has a, um, an issue over how it's perceived vis-a-vis -vis the budget. Depending on what they do with the budget when they manage this and bring down the budget in a couple of weeks, we might see a different um, tune being, um, being uh, paraded here. But at the moment, um, they face an uphill battle of being seen as appropriate economic managers, the $12 billion shortfall that people are talking about um, is going to make its job a lot harder in that mm. respect. But we need to wait and see what might happen um, when they bring the budget down. The other contextual issue here is that both parties in government have been particularly profligate um, in terms of their spending. Um, the rhetoric about the former Howard government is that it was you know, fiscally responsible and, and all the rest of it, but it was also a big spender over a number of areas. It had the advantage of ever-increasing income from the mining boom. Um, the Labor Party has had the, uh, that advantage initially, but then the boom has slowly wound its way back, and as a result of that, it's now facing the problem of, well, we've been having 10 years of various... Um, areas of largesse in different ways. We're committed to a couple of big ticket items and now we're not going to have the money coming in that we thought we had. So now they have to figure out, as I said, ways of, shall we say, tightening the belt. But I do note that the Prime Minister is um, at least making the rhetorical point that it has to be spread across the whole of society and not just simply 
you know, to a, mm. a narrow base. So we'll wait and see how she manages this. Now, Jim, in the last seven days also, we've found out about a gentleman who stepped into the political arena and he's a, a millionaire business, multi-millionaire businessman, Clive Palmer. Can you tell us a little bit about him and this party that he's establishing? Well, he was a, a very prominent member of the uh, Liberal Party in Queensland, the Liberal and National Party Coalition, shall we say. Um, I think last year or the year before, he gave up close to a million dollars uh, to, to the uh, coalition, both federally and um, uh, in the state of, of Queensland. Um, he's since resigned from that party. He was a life member. Um, he had a disagreement with Campbell Newman and decided that the way for him to go forward politically was um, to found his own party. Now, he's created a party that he's called the United Australia Party, which has, um, shall we say, some... Um, captures some of the heritage of the, the liberal tradition in Australia because um, between about 1931, 1941, about a 10-year period or so, there was a party called the United Australia Party. It was led by former Labor Treasurer, Joe Lyons, who um, left the Labor Party um, during the um, Great Depression and along with a number of other right-wing Labor members and um, the former National Party um, members as they were known then, um, at the time led by Stanley Bruce, who lost his seat, you might recall, um, in the 1931 elections as Prime Minister. So Joe Lyons founded, uh, along with others, the United Australia Party, which fell apart during the Second World War, and then Robert Menzies, who was a member, a former member of that party, founded what is now the, the current Liberal Party at the end of the Second World War. So Clive Palmer's drawing on that sort of heritage, if you like, However, it's an entirely new party, entirely different party. Um, we have yet to see what its particular platform will be, etc. We have even yet to find out whether it can in fact be registered as a political party because the Australian Electoral Commission has to authorise it and um, approve its registration. There is some difficulty here at the moment, or at least a small hurdle, um, and we wait and see how Clive Palmer will get do, over it. Do you foresee it having any substance or would it be maybe along the lines of another One Nation? That's difficult to say. Um, there's already a party called the Uniting Australia Party. So the first thing that has to happen is that the Clive Palmer's party has to somehow get past that so that the Electoral Commission can have both parties um, not registered. Not too much confusion. Yeah. Yes, not too much confusion. Then we need to think about, well, what impact will it have? It could divide the Conservative vote. It could weaken some parts of the Labor vote, um, although it's possible that it may end up simply being a localised phenomenon in Queensland. Who will he try to woo over? Will it be coalition members or will it be Labor members that he tries to woo? Well, it'll be um, disaffected Labor members. It'll be um, coalition members as well. He's planning to run a candidate in every seat, which is a big task, an expensive task, um, uh, Granted, he has deep pockets, but mm. it's still an expensive task. And um, he may have more chance of getting people into the Senate than necessarily getting people into the House of Representatives. It, it's possible, and I haven't done a close analysis of this, but it's possible, Dave, that the Labor Party might even benefit um, mm. a little in some of the marginal seats where, where the vote then gets split between uh, a new party like um, the United Australia Party and the other Conservative parties... And the Labor Party may not pick up votes, but it may... It'd be interesting to see, if he does get up, who he would give preferences to, well, if it got to that stage. I, my guess, you would expect him to, to preference the, the coalition parties, mm. but sometimes preferencing your direct opposition actually increases your benefit of the preferences um, because... Um, of the way in which the actual preferences get allocated and the deals done between the various parties. So we wait and see, Dave, on how that will actually work. My guess at the moment is that it's not likely to have the sort of impact that he wants. He's planning on becoming Prime Minister. That's He's quite explicit that I want to be Prime Minister. Mm. To do that, he's got to win you know, 51% of the seats in the House of Representatives or form a, a coalition with his party and other parties. It will be interesting to see whether um, the current Liberal Party, the current National Party, um, pay him any respect or heed in this regard, and it may be that they freeze his party out anyway. So it's it'll be interesting. There's also you know the perverse possibility that a rump Labor Party, which we're looking like having in the in the um, House of Representatives, might well um, um, pal up to um, Clive Palmer's party. 
um, given the way in which senior members of the Labor Party have been speaking and, um, um, shall we say, opting for different various policies, undermining their own government, um, anything's possible because they certainly haven't been loyal Labor Party supporters when in government. So it remains to be seen, Dave, what will happen. It's, it's an open question at present. It's still early days, but thanks for letting us My know pleasure, a little bit Dave. about him and the establishment of the party that he's looking at. We'll be back again next Tuesday morning. We look at state and federal politics with the University of Newcastle's Associate Professor in Politics, Dr Jim Joes.